first, I want to thank the Wilmington Education Foundation for helping to sponsor our speaker today and welcome school committee members and technology task force members from the community that are with us today. Last week in the second edition of Notes from the Whiteboard, I referred to an article by Nancy Walzer in this month's Harvard Education Letter. The article spoke about teaching 21st century skills. The author defined 21st century skills as including those needed to make the best use of rapidly changing technologies, the so-called soft skills that computers can't provide, like creativity, and those considered vital to working and living in an increasingly complex, rapidly changing global society. The article went on to, to quote Christopher Didi, who said, some of these skills have always been important, but are now taking on another meaning, like collaboration. Now you have to be able to collaborate across the globe with someone you might, ne might never meet. Some are unique to the 21st century. It's only relatively recently, for example, that you could get two million hits of an internet search and have to filter down a five for what you are looking for. The capabilities of computers and related technologies have repeatedly expanded since these devices were first developed back in the 1940s. From numerical calculators to data processes, to productive enhancers to information managers, to communication channels, to pervasive media for individual and collective expressions. The kinds of personal expressions enabled by sites such as MySpace and YouTube, the rich array, array of entertainment experiences available through massively multiplayer internet games, and the types of collective knowledge creation enabled by wikis and social tagging tools such as EdTags, all illustrate this ongoing evolution of information and communication technologies. The current approaches to using technology in schooling largely reflect applying ICT as a means of increasing the effectiveness of traditional instructional approaches, enhancing productivity through tools such as word processes, aiding communication by channels such as email, and expanding access to information via web browsers and streaming video. All these have proven worthy in conventional schooling as they have in workplace settings. However, none draw on the full power of ICT. We all know that education should prepare students for a world in which almost all types of routine cognitive tasks are done by computers and in which expert thinking and complex communications are the core intellectual capabilities by which people attain prosperity and economic security. Today's kindergartners will be retiring in the year 2073. We have no idea what the world will look like in five years, much less 60 years. Yet you are all charged with preparing our students for life in that world. Our students are facing many emerging issues, and we are faced with what to do in the classroom. Three years ago, Neil Alice and I sat in, sat in an audience and listened to Alan November challenge all of us to change the way we teach. He told us that it is our duty as educators to continue to sound the alarm and remind everyone that we must educate students for their future, not for our past. Ellen November is a futurist and technological visionary with one foot firmly grounded in the realities of everyday classroom life. His whirlwind of big ideas and provocative questions will surely get you excited this afternoon. He thrives on confirming and challenging educa educators' thoughts about what's, what's possible in the world of teaching and learning. And what I appreciate most about Alan November is that as a student, he pushes me to think about how I can make Wilmington Public Schools better and what we need to equip our students and our teachers as we travel through, through this 21st century. Please join me in welcoming Alan November. Thank you, the goddess of sound, okay. So you, you've come to hear a nerd talk. <laughs> I'm your motivational speaker. <laughs> there we go. 
You know, coming over here, I was listening to uh, NPR, and they had uh, John McCain's education advisor, forget her name, on a talk show. And uh, so it was one-sided. I'm just going to tell you about the show. And she says that currently the federal government spends $38 billion in K-12 through various programs. The only specific she could give, because he's, he's going to flatline that. He's not going to increase it. He's leveling education. The only change, she, specific change she could give is they're going to move a billion dollars from various programs into educational technology. And this is a guy who can't do email. You know. So where they came up with a billion, I, I don't know. But it's interesting to me that on the Republican side, they're going to move that much money into one program that doesn't even exist right now. So, and on the other side, on Obama's side, I, I think we'll probably see even more. So regardless of who becomes, wow, well, that's, <laughs> regardless, regard, that's amazing. I gotta stay over here. That's pretty good, huh? Um, this, this far is good. Uh, regardless of who becomes president, I think we're gonna see a change in educational technology. And I think we're gonna see a change in No Child Left Behind. There's going to be some more flexibility in the Bush administration. Somebody didn't think that completely through anyway in the beginning. Uh, so there's about to be a lot of change. And for those of you who want to read a book, new book, Harvard Business School Guide, Clayton Christensen, the center of the book, called Disruptive Class. Have you read Disruptive Class by chance? Nobody in this room. Disruptive Class? Well, why would you read a book from the Harvard Business School anyway? It, it doesn't make sense. But this is the first time any Harvard Business School professor has written a book about K-12 education. And it's all about technology and online learning. How in the next 15 years, essentially every course we have is going to be online. I just came from an industry meeting in Boston uh, yesterday of uh, Pearson and McGraw-Hill and Holt now became part of Google Littell, if you know they're all. They all have technology divisions, all these traditional textbook companies. And all of those companies are going to move all those textbooks online. That's what the meeting was essentially about. And I've written textbooks. And here, I'll show you very quickly what I'm talking about. Um, Stanford is a client of mine. I was, I was just mentioning this in a, in a lunch meeting I had. Let's just change this all together. And let me go to uh, .edu. Stanford. Oh, can't find it. Am I off? Oh, that could be. Did I lose my internet connection? Ah, I lost my internet connection. I'll do other things. No. We won't go to Stan. Yeah? No. See if I can get to Google. I can get to Google. I can get to Google. Let's see if I try this. GY. Don't eat you. Huh. Well, I lied. Let's see if Google works. Let's type in my last name. November. Search. Yay. Okay. Do you know how Google works? Let's just start with that. Then I'll find the Stanford thing. Okay, I typed in my last name. This is a quiz. I'm going to start at the beginning, and here's how the session's going to go. I'm going to start with uh, relatively boring, simple ideas, and then they're going to get much more complicated. That's how that's it goes. So, has there anybody not used Google? Anybody in the room not use Google? Everybody's used Google. Fair enough? At least once. You've heard about it? Okay. And uh, I typed in November, and I got. 1 billion, 190 million, that's a big number. And nobody is going to look at that result list. They're going to look at the top page. Can we agree? Am I describing you? Here's the average person. According to research, the average person, when they go on the net, 
they pick a search engine they like, typically Google, and they don't change search engines during a search. They stick with the one search engine where they begin. You tell me when this story doesn't meet your personal experience. Then, they typically only look at the top screen of results. No, you look at more? Wow. How many do you look at? A couple. Okay, two, three? We'll give you two, three. All right, all right, two, three. Wow, you're advanced. Okay, you're advanced. Now, in the results list of 1,190,000,000, my website is number one. November Learning. It's number one. And uh, you go at home, you try this at home, and I will be number one in your house. I'm number one in Hong Kong. I'm number one in Singapore, in Tel Aviv, and Shanghai. I'm, I'm number one. Your hearts are press, aren't you? I'm a billion. I don't even know what I did. We can just... Okay, next time, don't make me beg for you to apply. Okay? Try to get it right. Okay, how did I do this? And while you're thinking about how I did this, let me tell you I run a business. I run a business in educational consulting, and my last name is memorable, but not my first name, November, so people remember November, and they'll go to Google and type in November. And I used to be 500 million. When you're 500 million, even someone like you doesn't find my stuff. And I can't even be 50. You would look at the top 30. So I have to be, I decided to be at the top of the top of the top. And I made that happen. How did I do that? Yes. I did not pay for it. No. I'm cheap. No, no. No pay. I don't pay. No pay. I'm a teacher. Why do I pay? But no. 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 Hits. No. No. What? Keywords. No. No keywords. No hits. No pay. Free out. Free down. Come on. You use Google all the time. Come on. Look, look, if I, if I walked you into a library, I, I take you to something you know how it works. You only, can you imagine if you walked into a library and you didn't know how it was organized? And you only looked at the top shelf. No, it's not alphabetical. Oh, the library. Yes, yes, so, the library is alphabetical. That's right. And, and? You teach the children the alphabet for a lot of reasons. They got to learn the alphabet. One of the reasons they have to learn the alphabet is to look things up that are alphabetically stored. Correct? Okay. Now, what Joanne said, I haven't thought about that, 2073. Is it possible, according to research, 77% of your students use the internet as their first source for homework? Do you believe that? Yes. Okay. What if your children are going home every day and they don't know how Google works? They don't know. Because I'm going to show you, it means they can be manipulated by people who know how it works. They get their stuff up at the top. So chances are, every time you use Google, you've been manipulated by people like me. Yeah, how's Google work? Come on. How's it work? And you don't know yet, do you? Hmm? I'm not going to tell you. Number of hits. No, we've already been through that. Oh, I'm the first two. The second one's mine, too. I've never seen that. Wow. I'm getting better. And the third one is Wikipedia. Wikipedia is almost always at the top of a common search. Here, let's type in, uh, I don't know, I haven't done this, but got to learn to spell Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Is that how you spell it? And Wikipedia is number three. Number three for Massachusetts. Let's do uh, breast cancer. Something a little bit more serious. Breast cancer. Oh, no, I don't want that EDU thing. Get rid of that. Go there. Wikipedia. Number two. Any common phrase I type in Google, Wikipedia will probably be in the top five. Any word. Why is that? Because your kids are doing homework. Let me just tell you what's going to happen. Your kids are going to type in something you teach. 
and they are going to find Wikipedia. Trust me, go find it. And you have probably told them you can't trust it as a source, which means they all go there right away. <laughs> Telling kids not to go to Wikipedia really isn't the solution. Teaching them how Google works is. Oh. There, it's it's in front of you. Let's let's go back to November because I'll show you what Wikipedia does and what I do. And November, it's staring at you. Watch, see if you can get it. Wikipedia. I'll tell you what. I'll open this one. That's mine. All right, we'll put that one there, and then we'll open uh, Wikipedia. We we'll get that one. Wikipedia. That's that one. And there's mine. And there's Wikipedia. Whoop. Okay. Ta da. Now, what do you see is common for both? It's staring right at you. This is like giving you a book and say, Where is the author of the book? Where is the author? And you just don't know the look at the front page. It's that simple. You're staring. There's, there's Wikipedia, there's mine. What do you see that's common in both? It's in the address, it's in my address, and it's in the Wikipedia address. November, the word November. It's in the address. You see it now? Yeah, now you see it. And at the top of Wikipedia, they have a title bar. I have a title bar. Wait a minute, Wikipedia. The title bar for Wikipedia is also containing November in the title bar. My website, above it, says November Learning in the title bar. Google looks at the address and looks at the title bar and looks at your search term and tries to line things up. Okay? This is not rocket science. This is not. This is the equivalent of knowing where do I find the author of the book? And where do I find the title? This is not part. Fair enough? Little children can learn this. Little tiny children can learn this. Now, the other thing that makes the, the Wikipedia so phenomenally popular in Google, the reason it's at the top of almost any search, is there are other variables you can't see besides the URL and the title bar. Here, let me show you. Uh, if I go back to Google, whoop, Google, I spell Google, <laughs> Google, there we go. If I go back to Google and I want to see the hidden, this is like the Wizard of Oz, you know? And you think things are magic, but they're not. It's just a guy. Uh, it's www.wikipedia.org. Except I left out the W. I didn't mean to do that. W. Is that spelled right now, Wikipedia? <laughs> Dot org? Yeah? Yeah, good. Okay. So, just to show you, there are 16,000 web pages linking to Wikipedia.org. Do you know what a link is? A web page is connected to another web page? Yeah. And Google counts the number of links between web pages really fast, in a millisecond. And the number of links hitting a website from other web pages is popularity, and that moves to the top of Google. So the reason Wikipedia is number one in any common search is because it has more links going into it than any other web page, based on popularity. Now, if a library organized its books based on how often a book was taken out, you wouldn't allow that to happen. It has nothing to do with content, value, it has nothing to do with quality, it's just popularity. Your kids are going to use Google this year, right? Now, if we were starting a school from scratch, we didn't have school, we didn't have books, and we noticed that the internet was the dominant media of society, 
and the children, we probably would teach them how to do so. Because if you don't understand critical thinking, you could be in really big trouble. I could manipulate you all day long. Here, let me show you a bad example. So, am I blocked? Do you know? I'm unblocked. Okay, I asked to be released, right? Am I released? I'm, I'm released. I'm a guest. You released me. If I type in Martin Luther King in Google, I get 13 million hits. Almost 14 million. And of course, Wikipedia is toward the top. You now know why. You can see Martin Luther King is in the address, the green. And it's in the title bar. And it has links coming in. Oh, wow, does that have links coming in? But this one, this says it's true. And it's very close to the top. And it says that it's a great resource for teachers and students. So I'm 12 years old. Imagine I'm 12 and I'm home. And I'm doing some research on Martin Luther King. And I click on that site, right? I will click on that site. Because at home, I'm not filtered. Chances are my parents don't know how Google works either. And I've asked children all around the country who has put this on the internet, because I think knowing who the author is is important. And the children will tell me, the first thing they'll do is they look at the web address, and they'll say, it's the Martin Luther King organization. They put it on the internet. And I said, oh, I said, that's not right. By the way, I need to show you the punchline, which is not, not fun. And I bet a number of you have seen this. The people who put this on the internet is a white supremacist group named Stormfront. Here, let me show you the behind the ownership wall. Stormfront.org. They, they own it. And you'll see websites blocked by the town of Wilmington. Well, it should be blocked. It should be blocked. It's too bad. Uh, see if I can get through your filter. Hang on. <laughs> Hang on. Uh, yeah, don't look, okay? Don't look. Don't look. Don't look. Let's see. To get through filter. Uh, hmm. Well, I don't really have time, but I'll try a couple things and see if I can get through that way. You know, I was giving a presentation in another school, and they didn't take me off the filter. And there was a 12-year-old filming me in the back. And I asked him to come up to help me setting up. I needed some help. And I said, I need to get through your filter. Can you show me how? And he showed me how. And I said, well, why do you think your school filters? And he said, that's to protect the teachers. <laughs> oh, no, I can't get through that way either. Well, it'll take me, not today. Stormfront, take me back. Oh, please, just get through. Oh, no, all right. All right, well, not today. Here, I'll tell you what, I have it um, saved. Maybe, maybe not. Let's see, presentation material. Hmm, where do I have this? Infolet images. Sometimes I keep things. Stormfront, all right. So this is a picture of the website. White Pride Worldwide? Okay, these people, David Duke? Yeah. So that website owns the martinlutherking.org website. Now, if I were teaching you about books, one of the first things I would teach you is where to find the author's name of the book. Because I don't want you going off and reading anything I want you understanding that somebody wrote a book and that you should learn who to trust, right? You teach little children. I know you do, little children. So, I want you to know who put something on the internet. Where do you find the owner of a website? Where do you go? Right? This is basic. This is elementary, first grade. I'm going to tell you. I, I just took. But I don't know if I'm boring you or not. See, I hate doing that. But, um, so I'm going to guess that some of you don't know, and you're just not saying you don't know. So here we go. You absolutely. That's, that's clear. OK. 
That's my license. I can do it now. Where am I going? Easy who is. On the web, there are sites where when you go there, you can find out who owns a website. And one of those sites is easywhois.com. Easywhois.com. And it has this kind of search engine thing going, enter domain, and I'm going to type in www.martinlutherking.org. I want to know who owns it. See, if it were a book, I'd go to a title page, but there's no title page on the web. You just have to have a other sense of how things work. This is how they work. And now I can see that this web address, martinthekeng.org, was first granted January 14, 1999, and it's owned by Don Black, and he's with Stormfront. Now I know that Stormfront owns martinthekeng.org. Okay, just imagine, for a moment, imagine that books are a new thing. Books are a new thing. And kids have access to all the books. All the books. Not just the books in the library, all the books. And by the way, 90% of the books are crap, or worse. Books, as a group, are terrible. We only read the smallest, little, tiny percentage of all books published. And even smaller than that, the children. But just imagine the kids have access to all the books. And they didn't know how to find the author of any of those books. And they didn't know why those books popped up. They just didn't know. That'd be a disaster. That's what's happening on the web in the United States. We have children who have access to all of the information on the planet who don't know how the web works. But they don't know, they don't know. They think they know. I've asked kids, you know how the web works? Duh. <laughs> of course they do. No, they don't. They don't. What? Oh, it's open? You made a call? You have power. Whoa. Do You did that? Wow. I, I want to know you. This is great. Stormfront? .org, there it is. White Pride Worldwide. And uh, David Duke? 91608. That's today. That's today. Now, every day they have podcasts. They have white supremacists beating their drum. And they have discussion groups. And you can join, and on your birthday, you get a birthday card from these people. When you sign up and become a member, and you fill in your birthday, that time, from that time on, you get a personal card in your email. And every day, you can listen to David Duke and others, and you can contribute, you can discuss things. These are sophisticated people, technically. This website, white supremacist website, I hate to say this, I don't know why I'm even saying this, is more sophisticated than most school websites in the United States. They understand children. They know that every kid has an iPod or an MP3 player. Did you know? Did you know that? Do you believe that? And they know that kids want to take those things around, the little white button earphones around, wherever they go, and they should be content in those iPods, and it should be their stuff. So they can put that stuff in their iPod. Walk around with that stuff. Any questions? OK. The world's a cruel place. Your kid goes home, they're going to find this in Google, number two out of 14 million. Do they know why it's that high? Click here to connect to Stormfront Radio. Now, I don't know how to say this. I think every teacher in this room should be podcasting every day. You need to compete with these people. You, you're laughing, okay? It's fine. Keep laughing. How many of you have made a podcast out of curiosity? Two, three, four? Here, let me show you some children doing it. Let me, let me jump. I have a friend who teaches in Wells, Maine, and uh, Bob Sprinkle. And Bob Sprinkle doesn't do a daily podcast, they do once a week. Here, I'm going to uh, share this little movie. Second grade kids. Now play. See if it... Hi, this is from Germany. This is how we make podcasts. That's
that doesn't sound so good. Let me... I should explain. Uh, that little girl is the team leader of this week's podcast. And during the week before, there, another little girl has a camera. You know, a still image camera? I bet all of you have one. I bet you know what I'm talking about. Your cell phone might have a camera. And children during the week, in second and third grade, they take pictures of what's going on. They take art display, and they take the science project, and they take pictures. So by the end of the week, they have a lot of pictures. And they have an audio recorder. And they go around, and they interview the children learning whatever they're learning. And they interview the teacher. They might interview the principal. So at the end of the week, they have all this rough audio footage. So they have visual images, and they have audio. And then they have some software that little children can use. And they grab the pictures, and they grab the audio, and they smush it together. And now they have an online tutorial of what happened last week in class. Every week. It goes on the web every week. They can play their iPod, they can play their computer at home. They, but the important thing is they're teaching children to produce it. The children are producing a curriculum review every week of what happens in second and third grade. Here, I'll show the rest. Oh, wow, we're here though. You see the chart? The chart, it's paper, which is fine. Courtney, that's Courtney. So Courtney's job is to organize all the names. They have a writer and a producer and an editor and a mixer. They have all these jobs. They have all these jobs. And they have to get it organized. So it's really not about technology. I'm just going to tell you the technology is the easiest part. It's what you put in the podcast, which is harder than podcast. And, and the organization, it's like writing. The pencil sharpener is not the key to writing a good paper. It's knowing what words to use with a pencil. It's, it's like that. So don't think of it even as podcasting. Think of it as producing rich content.
that some of you are technophobic. Let's just decide. We'll just admit this. It's just going to admit it. Good. Now we're past that. But listen, and this is quite serious. We cannot allow, we shouldn't allow, the lack of skill of a teacher to prevent children from expanding the boundaries of creativity and imagination. This is not a good idea. Imagine you couldn't sharpen a pencil. You don't know how to use the pencil sharpener. Therefore, no child in your class can use a pencil. They have to memorize everything. But you didn't learn how to use a pencil sharpener. This is, this is the same with podcasting. Podcasting is just the pencil sharpener. It's the content that's important. Just take the children with you. Okay, so there they are. Oh, I want to show you one more little bit of this movie. Next job. We're just going to go through it. Next job, um, I actually learned uh, California. My next job, where is it? Mm. I'm going to go to browser. Um, here. Next job is middle school, math. This a 12-year-old girl who has put together a tutorial. Here, I'll make this bigger. Oh, it's coming in. Hi, I'm Bob, and I'm going to show you how to do prime factor division. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a factor tree. A factor tree is you take a number, such as the number 32, and you break it up into its prime factors. So 32, we're going to break it up into the numbers 2 and 16. So we're going to try to get it down to all prime numbers. The prime number is when a number is only divisible by one in itself. 32 is composite, meaning that it is divisible by more than the number 2 in itself. So 32 is divisible by 2. All right, you get it. She, she runs through this, and she explains prime factorization using, I'm going to try to slide this across. Hang on for a sec. She, uh, she just keeps going. In fact, then she won't stop. Then she shows you how to do it another way. Here's, here's the second way. Instead of 2 by 16, she does 8 by 4. Because you might have done that first. And then she explains how to get to prime numbers that way until finally it's 2 to the fifth. Do, same answer. Same answer. Thanks for listening. I'm Bob. Goodbye. My friend, Eric Marcos, teaches sixth grade. He teaches math. And he has, every week, children producing little video like this one, a minute, two minutes, two minutes, that explain the entire curriculum. When children produce tutorials, and they know the other children are going to be using them to prepare for the test, 
they take that work a little bit more seriously than doing homework for a grade. Do you believe that? That the, the, the necessity to get it right because every other kid in class is going to have access to your tutorial and at home and in their iPod and all this goes everywhere, you understand that? Means that the work is more important and takes better care than if it's only my homework that I can just get rid of. So we have two jobs so far. We have the weekly podcasting team, taking pictures, taking audio, putting together a review of what we learned last week. And we take homework and we give some children different homework than the other children. Their job is to produce a tutorial for the class. Now, MCAS Mathematics in Massachusetts has a problem. I'd start with math. I don't know what your test scores are, but if it's the typical MCAS situation, all children are not performing at the highest level, right? The answer is yes. Okay. The answer is yes. And if you wanted to get all children performing at the highest level, I know this sounds really strange, you would empower the children to figure out how to teach the other children math. That is really strange. I know that's strange. Here, let me show you how easy this is to do. Just in case you've never seen screencasting. It's, it's called screencasting. And, uh-oh. Well, let's just see if I can do one. I'll show you a trick I learned on the web. Um, we'll go to Alta Vista. And, uh... I needed to figure out how to search across NASA's web pages. NASA has a lot of web pages. I didn't want to use Google to do all of the world. I just wanted NASA. Here, I'll show you how I figured it out. So I'm going to click on that little sun. By the way, the software is free, free software on the web called jingproject.com. You download the software. It's on your computer. And they give you a free website as well to store all your little videos you make. Free. And this is how easy it is to do. You open up any application. It can be a word processing document if you're teaching sentence structure. It can be an art Photoshop if you're teaching people how to use Photoshop. It can be a math tablet if you're teaching people math. It can be anything. I'm going to open up a browser. And then I'm going to click on this little, whoa, don't look, don't look, don't look. Okay, you look. Uh, back to Alta Vista. I don't know where that went. But I can go there. And I'm typing in the host command just to get ready for my little video because I, I don't want to waste time later. NASA.gov. All right. And then I click on Jing, click on the crosshair. Click on, uh, click on the crosshair, bring that down, click on video, I have three seconds to clear my voice. <clears throat> Today's lesson is using AltaVista to search one domain name by typing a command called host, and then a colon, and then only the domain name, in this case NASA.gov, I can find out how many pages NASA has. And NASA has 5,700,000. If I want to search within those pages, I can type in a bunch of keywords like Mars, Rover, and Solar. And we'll throw in lesson plan in quotes. And I'll do a find, and it cuts through the 5 million, and I have 36 web pages by searching only in NASA that gives me exactly what I want. Instead of using Google for the same search, that would have been a mess. And that's how you use the host command to limit your search to one domain name. And then I click stop. And then I have my video, I'm done.
And I could send this to the web right now. I can save it on my hard drive. I can do anything I want with it. This is low-hanging fruit. There's nothing easier than this. You just open J in the background, do whatever you do, talk, and you have a video. That's it. Jing, Jing. Jing, here. If you want to play with it, that you know what? Don't play with it. Just tell your kids about Jing. Uh, uh, if I go to a new window, here, we'll get you Jing. Um, www.jingproject.com. Too many W's. Yeah. Too many W's. By the way, uh, you should help me. I'm actually recovering from a torn retina surgery, so everything's blurry to me. Just tell me when I get it wrong. I don't mind at all. You'll help me. Uh, download for Mac, download for Windows. You have Jing. Free software. Free website, too. By the way, if this were middle school kids, if I were in a class, and I show 12-year-olds how to do this. Some of them literally jump out of their seat and say, can I do one now? It's, you're not jumping. And, and I understand, I don't expect you to jump all day, but middle school kids will jump. What do you think? Is it useful to have middle school children in math designing tutorials for the other children to look at? By the way, there's really interesting research now. If you read a book with your own voice in the back of your head, you're reading the book, or you might go to Amazon and get an audio book, the actor's voice of the audio book will actually give you a different interpretation of the book than if you read the book yourself. It now looks like a different voice will give you a different interpretation. The teacher's voice, your voice, is no longer sufficient. We can have lots of children coming up with clever strategies in different voices, teaching the same content. And some children will be able to hear the other children in a better way than they can hear me. I used to teach math. Okay, any questions? That's job number two. So far we have the first job, we're going to teach children to do podcasts, we're reviewing last week's work. Second job, we're going to take the entire curriculum, we're going to chop it up into little videos, and we're going to have the children produce an entire library of video tutorials that every child can use to prepare for the next test. And you, the teacher, will be the editor, Publisher, you approve videos. That's any questions? Up? Yes. Uh, I can't hear you. Sorry. Parents? Oh, I I I actually have some experience with parents. Uh, I do a summer conference at the Newton Marriott in July. So Eric Marcos is the teacher. LA, he's from LA. And, uh, and his school is, LA is a client of mine, so we're doing this. And uh, so Eric's got really good. And I said, Eric, will you come to Boston in July and give a workshop? And he, he'd love to do that. Three weeks after I invite Eric, this is last January, right? I get a call. Eric's on the phone, and he says, I've told my class that I'm coming to Boston to your conference. And Bob, that's not her real name, Bob got upset. She says, that's my stuff. You can't go to Boston and show my stuff and the other kids too. So Eric asked me if it would be okay if Bob co-presented. She's 12. And I'm thinking, I have to fly this kid and from LA and put her up at the Marriott? And what am I going to do with her at night? What's, this is a mess. I'm thinking, no, no. So I told Bob, my budget is spent. I'm sorry. And Bob said, no, you don't understand. Her parents are coming. They bought tickets for her sister also in the same class. And they flew to Boston, and they presented the workshop. 
I met the parents. These parents tell me for the first time these kids are up late at night doing math over and over and over again until they get the video just right. Now, you compare that to doing the odd questions at the back of a textbook, it's not the same thing. Okay, yeah? Parents. Parents? Parents. Okay. That was the second job. You ready for the third job? Third job. In Google, uh, there is a new tool. Well, there's a lot of new tools in Google. Google's always come up with cool, cool tools. I bet you've seen more. When you've used Google, have you ever wondered what's more? More what? More, 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 more what? Well, they got all these little things here. We don't even have time to go through this. But then they ran out of words, and they had to say even more. <laughs> you ever wonder what that is? More, then there's even more. So you go to even more. <laughs> this is ridiculous. But that's what they did. And then they have this custom search engine right there. Custom search. You can build a search engine from scratch. Nothing's in it. It's your search engine. So I'm going to click on that search engine. And all you do is you hit create custom search engine. And then you know the routine. You go through, what do you want to name your search engine? You can name it anything you want. Just a name. And then uh, down here, once you get past naming your search engine, you can uh, only the sites I select. Keep it on that little radio button. And then over here, you start typing in web addresses. Now you have a search engine. Here, I'll show you. I got a bunch of them ready to go, like the cooking show. I, I, I made some before you came. And uh, here, I'll show you. I got a bunch of them. Our elementary school. So click on the home page. That's what it looks like. Your title is there, our elementary school. And uh, it has its own little web address. So people can go to it. Let's see, the Montebello Eagles. That's better. OK. That's the name of an elementary school. Now, let's type in math. We'll just type in math in the Montebello Eagles search engine, math. And we'll hit search. And it's fun brain and brain pop. And I know that because the teachers put that in. The teachers built a search engine that all the families in town can use rather than Google. Type math in Google as an elementary kid. It doesn't make any sense if you're an elementary kid. Now, as a parent, let's go back to parents. Parents are getting scared about their kids on the web. They got Facebook to contend with, they got MySpace, they got bullying on email. Oh my gosh, I talk to parents all the time. More and more of them are, and Google will get you into big trouble quickly, like a hate group typing in Martin Luther King. Do you agree? In your house. So your house has become this place of evil, right in the kids' bedroom. It's an evil place now. If the elementary teachers sitting in this room got together and you build a search engine of your favorite websites for children. By the way, a hundred people can build a website search engine together. You can be anywhere, you can be at home, you can be in school, you can be in a library, you can be anywhere on the planet, a hundred people can be co-authoring a search engine together. Is that clear? But unlimited number of people can use the search engine. Okay, explain that. Okay. So frankly, and I don't, I don't have time to waste anymore, if I were principal of an elementary school, this is how we would start the school year. I would say, we're going to build a search engine for the families in town. And we're all going to work together as a team of teachers. And we're going to give them our knowledge in their house. Otherwise, they're using Google, and that's not good for elementary children. If I were teaching math, math again, calculus, I would have a search engine just on calculus that my kids contribute with me. 
eight new children can do this. Okay, how many of you have built a search engine? Just out of curiosity, you've figured this out, you've organized your class or your faculty, and you've built a search engine together that takes the knowledge of a lot of people in one place. No. All right. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. How to get it? Yeah. Love to. Love, I love it when I get a question. It's so rare. That's great. It is. It's great. In fact, I, I should have told you at the beginning. I just felt too comfortable here. I was joking. I, I was the technology director in the high school where Ferris Bueller's Day Off was made. And uh, I love that scene with Ben Stein when he says, anybody, somebody? Kids drooling on his desk, you know? Okay, more. You start with more. Did you see more? I gotta take this off, this is too hot. Oh, I'm in the way, anyway, all right. There's, there's more. You click on more, and I'm not kidding. This sounds like I'm kidding, but you go down to even more. Even more. And then you go over to custom search. And you click on custom search. And then you create a search engine and you type in the name of your search engine. You can call it, you know, Wilmington Geniuses. Anything you want. Whatever you want. Right there. Wilmington Geniuses. And then you have to describe your search engine. It's for all of us. And then, don't put in keywords. I'd skip that. And then you put sites I select, and here, you type in www. Fair enough? That's it. That's, that's as complicated as it gets, but once you have one, you might want to add to it and do other things. So, I'm going to show you one that's built, so you can play with one. No, 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 no. They can't be firewalling my search engines. Yes, they are. Why? Why? What's the point? Aye. What is the point? Okay, this time it works. I don't know why it didn't work. I, Okay, so I'm going to give you an example. I do another summer conference on global warming with some scientists from Woods Hole. Where is this? Climate change. Yeah, we had to change the name because global warming didn't exist in Texas, so we had to call it climate change. All right. Now, <laughs> it's true. I'm not kidding. Wish I were kidding. I'm not kidding. Okay, edit this group. Now, edit the search engine. So I have a collaboration tool in my search engine. And I can click on that collaboration tool, and I have these three people who are on my team. They can add any time they want to, and I can add you now. I say your first name, your last name, your email, then I write a message here, and I send the invitation, and you get an email from me through the search engine. And it invites you to add your resources. So, we have a couple scientists at Woods Hole adding resources, and we have some middle school teachers in Falmouth adding some resources. People can use this search engine from all over the world. The children are coming up with sites that they give to their teacher, and when a child knows that they can build a search engine that's different than using Google, now you're teaching them design rather than just using something somebody else designed. Or not, apparently. You have a web address. Here, I'll show you. Yes, okay. How does somebody access your search engine? You, uh, hmm. Each of these search engines that I have, a long list here, because I do a lot of workshops, um, well, we'll go to the Montebello Eagles. Okay, believe it or not, that's terrible. That's the web address. That long thing. That's no good. So what you do, you, you have to copy this web address and send an email, and you put a link on your website. Then everybody knows. So if Wilmington has a web a search, I'm sorry. Wilmington Public Schools has a website. What I would do Let's say the elementary faculty actually does this. I would take the search engine address 
and I would say, here is our search engine that the faculty have built for you to use at home. Click here. That's it. Or, if you want to make this one a small one, you copy it. I'll show you this trick. If you don't know, you know the routine. Copy, copy, copy. Wait, miss copy. Under edit, right? Edit, <laughs> copy. Come on, copy. Copy. You copy the web address and you go to tinyurl.com. Whenever you want to take a big address, make it a small address, you just paste the big address and say, well, make me a small one. And now the new web address is tinyurl59tpcy. Now I have a small address. And I'll show you. See, there it is. It is the Eagles. That's not a problem. We can get everybody to show the website. That's fine. We can do that. No, no, no. That wasn't, that wasn't a cue. Sorry. Sorry. Wrong cue. Now, think like a kid. Okay? I know you're an adult. Think, do you think children would be interested? And I'm going to tell you, I only know one teacher. I wish I could tell you that this is a success, but I'm making this up, frankly. Uh, I mean, the, the tool is there, but I only know one teacher in the country who has done this. And he's an art teacher. And an art teacher has a special murals. He gets the kids to build a mural for the school, and design a mural, and paint a mural. And this year, he had kids going out on the web looking for murals all over the world. And the mural, videos of the mural, of making the mural. You know, there's a lot of stuff on murals. So the kids found out there's lots of murals. Other schools with murals. Oh my gosh. And he had an email thing going where they would email him and they'd say, I found this website, add this one to the search engine. Then, school ended every week for the last this last summer, every single week, he had at least one kid emailing him, here's another one. That's after school had ended. How many of you had that problem? Kids sending you resources and the subject you talk who were on summer vacation. How many of you? No? So watch out, because once you empower people to build a tool that other people around the world can use, School ends, it doesn't end, it keeps going. You too, yay. And your art teacher, art teacher, another art teacher. And I, I believe you, art teachers have it together. Studio, relationships, build a community, right? You teach one in art, don't you? You teach two, what? Brooklyn girls. She said that. Oh, okay, now, we've done that geography thing. Um, yeah, art teachers. Are you okay on search engine? Now, so, I, I don't know if you're putting all the pieces together, but the concept is we have a lot of tools now where you can take more and more control over your own learning and contribute it to others at the same time. This is a good thing for children. I used to teach uh, history in Lexington High School. Fox in the high school. You know the green, Mass Ave, you know. Usually I'm in Oklahoma explaining this, but you know. Okay. So you know that the British were marching from uh, Cambridge to Concord and Concord. Remember the story? They had to go through Lexington, of course. And when they got to the green, that's the first time shots were fired. And no one really knows who fired first, except the colonists. It is known that they missed. They didn't hit anything in Lexington. They hit later. Later they figured out hide behind trees and stuff like that. But in Lexington, and this is a full dress uniform parade on Mass Ave. This is hard to miss. Why did the colonists miss? This has nothing to do with technology, by the way. It's history. Why did the colonists miss? They're walking away. No, I don't think so. No, they were engaged. 
they shot. When they shot, they missed. They may have been walking away after they got shot back at, but they initially missed. Okay, if you go to Lexington, all the buildings are still there. The little white ones, you know, all around the green. What was the building they were in before they came out to shoot? It was a tavern. They were plastered. The colonists were drunk. They don't shoot straight. Drunk colonists, terrible. The British were thirsty. They were marching from Cambridge. They weren't drunk. Now, this will not be taught in our history classes because parents will really get upset with you. If you teach the children that we had drunk colonists and they go home and tell their parents, if you told them that, there will be an uproar. There will be a school board meeting. You can't handle the truth. You know that movie. Okay. Now, what if I were to tell you that the British have a different version of events than we do on that and a lot of other things? In fact, I've been there on July 4th. I am here to tell you they don't have fireworks. They don't even celebrate. There isn't even a mention on the radio. It's like it never happened. So, I got to excite kids who didn't like history, even in Lexington. Yeah, they don't, they don't care. They ride their bikes over that park every day. Who cares what the British did? They could care less. So, post, colon, remember this lesson? ac.uk. Here's another application. Every web address has an extension. Every one. gov, edu, dot com. Those are all extensions. Every web address has an extension. Outside the United States, in the extension position, is a two-letter country code. JP for Japan, AU for Australia, UK for UK. AC replaces EDU. The rest of the world largely does not use EDU. They use AC for academic. So by typing in host colon AC.UK, I'm only going to get academic websites in England. Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. All right. And then I'm going to type in uh, the American revo revolution. And I'm interested in General Gage. He was the opposing general that day. We don't study him either, but they had a general. A guy named Gage. And I get three. Eh, I don't like that. Not enough for me. Okay, so then I'm going to switch this over. I know there's more. Oh, it won't matter. I could press worldwide. Here, I'll do that. I'll do that just for you. Worldwide. And click find. And it's still free. Okay? Okay. You bet. Anytime. Uh, no, no, no. It's a good question. It was a great, great, it was a good question. So I'm just going to copy all that bit there. This is actually a teachable moment. Change search engines. Don't stick with one search engine. Now I'm going back to Google because Google is doing a better and better job. But the word is site, not host. Different word. The search engines did not agree on the same syntax. Now, this one, well, let me see if you can quickly review. The first one is Oxford. O-X, that's Oxford University. And uh, these, are, these are Aberdeen University. I don't even know what RHS is, another university. Now, why did the American colonists revolt? I want to know. So I click on that one at Oxford. Well, it's a myth. Contrary to the picture presented in primary schools, here, I like this part, turkey eating people. I like that part. Because kids laugh. You laugh, kids laugh. Now, once I get a history class in ninth grade to laugh, I got it. Trust me, got it. I've actually had kids beg me to read the rest of this. Beg me, because that'll never go past that. I just kind of tease them. Now, in fact, this will become an exercise, because I've talked too long. Let's say that you can play this trick, and you can find sources all over the world that pertain to anything you teach, in art, in music, history, literature, physics, anything. I can do this, just like that. And I've learned that when you show people how the other world sees things, it confuses them. And when you're confused, it's a moment to capture the imagination. What's the assignment? 
that you can give children who are studying U.S. history to help them make meaning out of the British version of events in the textbook. U.S. version of events. Just trust me, there's two different versions of events. They are very, very different. Why we went to war, why we were in that war, the results of that war. Benjamin Franklin was more important than Washington because without the French, we never would have won that war. Franklin got the French, 30,000 troops. This is a completely different version of events. Okay, I'm going to give you five minutes. Talk to your neighbor. Come up with the most brilliant, creative use of technology that will help your children make meaning of two different versions of events. Say hi to your neighbor. Do you like each other? You okay with this? Yeah, just say hi and figure it out. You're not the art teacher. Oh, you're the art teacher. Sorry, proximity. Yes. A podcast? One of the students has, uh, his, he and his family are, they reenact Revolutionary War battles. He and his family are the British. Oh yeah. And he shared what they wore, how they yes. lived, and they to be authentic during the, yes. the whole weekend. And the other students found it very interesting. So I thought yes. that was So great. you're gonna divide the class into two groups. One's the British, the other is the colonists. What if I could teach you how to find schools in England? studying the American Revolution. And what if I could show you a piece of software for free that can connect you to any computer in the world for a free phone call where you can push the button and make the podcast. So your children are going to be told on Friday you're going to have a debate with three sites. You can put five up, by the way. We'll take three. You're going to have a debate with three sites across England where they are studying the American Revolution. And we're going to record it. And we're going to put it on the web for the whole world to hear. You better win, that was our war. <laughs> That's what I would say. So just to show you, in case, just in case you don't know, the software to use for the telephone is Skype. Oh, hello, Alan. Oh, here's one from uh, England. I get rid of that, sorry. Close four chats. Yeah, close all that. I use Skype all the time. It's, um, let's see if I can find somebody who will actually talk to me. Oh, my. Everybody's asleep. You use Skype? You use Skype to Iraq? Yeah. Your son-in-law in Iraq. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, Skype is amazing. In fact, for some families, it's the only way to get to Iraq. They have to use Skype. Um, but let me see if I can, ah, none of my trusted souls. See, this is, this is my list of friends, but they're all sleeping. Why are they sleeping? Oh, I feel terrible. Chris, maybe Chris. Call. This is the wrong Chris, I think. Can you hear? Chris's computer is ringing. If Chris is around, he may or may not answer. Yeah, it looks like the wrong Chris. Kokomo, that's in Indiana. Oh, I know Chris. Oh, his computer just went to sleep. He's sleeping. That's the end of Chris. Uh, I don't know whether you believe me or not, but you go to Skype and you can talk to any computer in the world for free. It's absolutely amazing what can happen. Here, I'll show you how to do this. How many of you have Skype? Oh, a ton of you do. All right, the rest of you don't pay the phone company anymore for long distance calls. That's got to end starting today. No more paying phone company. What you do instead is you go to the web and you go to this website, skype.com, Skype. Go get Skype. Skype. Here, it's what it, can you see? I'm in the way, I gotta move this. I should have moved that before. I'm fine, fine. Then you download, hit download, download Skype. Now, it knows I have a Mac. If you have Windows, it knows you have Windows. Don't be put off that says Mac, it will say Windows for the other side. And you just click download and the software goes into your hard drive. You have to have Skype software in your hard drive. Then the first time you run it, it will fill out a form for you, a form opens, and it says, what username do you want? Now for the women in the room, I'm going to suggest that you do not use a woman's name. Because some Russian guy will try to marry you. Now, if you want that, it's okay. You just know that's going to happen. Russian guy. Uh, that's, that's okay. Uh, my, my Skype username is Global Earner. I, I meant it to be Global Learner, but I left out the second L. So I'm Global Earner, but it works for me. It works great. And uh, maybe by the end of this workshop, I just don't know all these people. Sometimes people want to be my friend and I don't know them, so. I'm looking to see Peggy Sheehy. Boy, some of these people are so much fun to talk to, but I don't know them. Ah, I know what I can do, telephone. Is anybody willing to give me their, you have a cell phone with you? I can call you. No one's willing. You are, you don't mind? Your phone's gonna be shown. Okay, give me your phone. Nine, seven, eight. What is it? Six, nine. Six, nine? You don't know yourself? Six, four, nine. Wait, 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 okay. I got nine, seven, eight. Six, six, zero, four. Four, six, four, nine. You, you're sure? All right, so. It's going to call your cell phone. That's you. But you're in the room with me, so we're getting feedback. If you were in Thailand, it would be better. OK. OK. Now, the first time I saw Skype, if I may, uh, it was in a kindergarten private school in Philadelphia. A little girl was crying her head off, according to the teacher, unconsolable tears on the first day and beyond the normal crying you might get. And the girl was from India and she was out of place and confused and she really missed her grandmother. The family had just moved and the grandmother didn't come and she missed her grandmother. So the teacher knew about Skype and the grandmother had email. So she emails the grandmother and the grandmother downloads Skype in India and the next day the little girl comes to school and talks live to her grandmother. 
from class to India from kindergarten. And she's talking, like I'm talking now. That's all. Just talking. And they have speakers, like we have here. And the other children in class are listening to this conversation. And they start moving over to the little girl, because they want to talk to the grandmother in India, too. The other children. And then finally, what does one kid say? One kid says, well, where's my grandmother? Where's mine? I want mine. In the box. I want a grandmother in the box, just like this girl. Why isn't my grandmother in this box? And the teacher, you know, has the wherewithal. This is interesting. She emails. She has 10 grandparents with email. How many do you think you have with email? Uh, who knows? I don't know. Find out. And they get the email going, and they download Skype. Ten grandparents. One of those grandparents has a great Irish accent. You know, there's a little girl, she's turned around. And they're reading a book of immigration from Ireland to Boston. You know, they have little story books. And they ship, they mail, real postal mail to the grandmother. They mail the book. And she reads the book from her house to school. Right? She's in New Jersey. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. She has an Irish accent. You have grandparents all over the country, too. Where did your grandparents live? Right? OK, now, they record it. They hit the record button. That's how record. So the book is an audio book now. They put it on a CD for every kid. Every kid takes that book home in the grandmother's books. That's the book they read over and over and over again. Because at home, they hear the grandmother's voice. This year, they're going to ship all the books to grandmothers. <laughs> Probably breaking every copyright law, but they're shipping the books. And they're going to have a reading once a week from a grandparent back to class. They're going to record all that. All the books are going to go on a CD. You have to teach reading. You might as well give kids an audio book. They, they will listen over and over again. Or not. Or don't do it. Do you know what I mean? It is perfect. What is not to like about this story? I mean, you could hate technology. And I think you should. I hate technology. <coughs> but you got to like grandmothers, right? you got to like grandmothers. All right. So we're going to have a grandmother network. Oh, and the next step is finding you the school in England. You've been very patient with me. I went way off on a tangent, didn't I? Um, ePals. There are lots of these, but this is the best that I know, ePals.com. I want to find a teacher in any country, any country. In fact, one of you should try to fool me, come up with a crazy place. In the meantime, search by map. <coughs> Excuse me. I click on Europe. And when I get to Europe, it builds it up. Click on the United Kingdom, builds it up. And in England, there are 7,800 teachers who've signed up. And there they are. And I have their email. They want to play. I'm going to send an email to 10 teachers. Actually, I'm going to teach the kids to send the email. I'm going to have the children write to teachers in England explaining we're studying the American Revolution and to find out which teachers would like to engage in conversation with us. I think we should teach children to work with people around the world. Every child becomes a global communicator. Every single kid. In every subject. If you want to. Only if you want to. But if kids were in the room, they would want to. Okay, so do you want to name a country? Name a country. How about somebody up there? Are you with me? I can't tell. China. China? Which one? Cameroon. Cameroon. Well, you're going to have to help me. Where the heck is Cameroon? Uh, is it in Africa? Cameroon. Cameroon is one of those African-speaking countries where they speak French, isn't it? And that's interesting, because if I were teaching, uh-oh, what coast should I be on? West? West. Cameroon, right there. The green one, Cameroon. All right, click on Cameroon, and I've got uh, 
25 teachers in Cameroon have signed up. Okay? First language is English. First language is French. Now, let's say you're teaching French. Let's just say. And let's say, I forget how many countries around the world are French speaking, but it's close to 50. 55. 55. There are 50, thank you. Who knew that? What are you, crazy? 55? How do you know this? Okay, good, good. I trust you, 55. And let's just say that some are in the Caribbean, and some are in Africa, and one is in Canada, got some in Europe, right? Yes. Speaking French, except it's not the same French. Yes, it is. <laughs> you understand what I mean? Quebec French is a different accent. The culture in Canada is different. The way they think about Muslims is different. Just trust me. Just trust me, it's different. In any case, if I were teaching French, I'm going to give you this specific example. When I was uh, back in Ferris Bueller's high school, uh, I had a friend, Julio Guerrero. And Julio Guerrero was a Cuban immigrant and taught Spanish, taught AP Spanish. And she's very good. She looks like she's from Cuba, meaning in Manhattan's bad. She's dark skinned and uh, speaks fluent Spanish. But she called me and she said, I want my kids to have authentic conversations with people who live in Spanish speaking countries. So we set her up with, at the time, something like Skype. And the first thing is Puerto Rico. She travels, she has friends everywhere. And we founded a school in Puerto Rico that agreed three times a week for 20 minutes to talk to this class. And the first time we did it, it was a boy near Chicago, and the first kid was a girl in Puerto Rico. And they're talking, and you can see her huge on the screen. Massive photo, live video. Skype comes with video, also. So there she is, bigger than everybody else, and he's talking, and all of a sudden, he starts stuttering. He goes down fast and fast. And she is speaking fluent English, and she says, are you okay? And he says, no, I'm not. She says, what's wrong? And he says, you don't look like I thought you should look. And she's blonde and blue eyed. And he's expecting a dark skin like Julio Guerrero, his teacher. And that's all he knows. People from the Caribbean are dark skinned. And she says, what's wrong? And he says, you don't look like I think you should look. And she says, how do you think I should look? And he says, well, you know, you should look more Mexican. When you tell a Puerto Rican, <laughs> she went ballistic. I mean, she hit the roof, screaming at this kid. How rude, how, how stupid. Oh my, he could have gone. The kids in both rooms were laughing hysterically. <laughs> hysterically. And we recorded it. We played it back for this kid. Could you have said anything else? <laughs> now, Julia Guerrero claims that she could have taught that class all year and he never would have an experience like that. Where he has to deal with somebody in a different culture, real time. That's the difference. So, languages, if you teach a language, this year, you connect kids to all 55 countries speaking the language and understanding cultural differences between Africa and Canada. That's languages. That's global. Yes, it's worthwhile. And you're the only teacher who knew there were 55. All right, now. Any questions about that? I can find all 55. Yes. You don't. But I can research them, wanna see? I mean, uh, uh, okay. Uh, how do I know? How do I know? Uh, all right. Um, let's say, oh, Cameroon. Uh, you know what, I'm not a member, but we have lots of interest in leadership. This is in leadership, age is 15. You get the contact, what was the name of the school? Ah. 
They're going to tell me to join. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't join because I'm not a teacher. Um, only teachers can join. That's one. Only teachers can join. Um, you, you remember? Oh, you mean type in your... You know what I'm going to do? I'm looking for a... See, university... I'm a final year... Wait a minute. Let me see if I can find... This one's in French. I can't read that one at all. University of College of Technology, I'm a student in 20, new, I can't read the French. Um, here, let me show you a general, general skill of cross-referencing. Here, let me go back to uh, Alta Vista. I should have shown you this at the beginning anyway, because validating information on the web might be the number one skill. You don't know that anything's true anymore. The, the rules have all changed. I, I can show you stuff that you might think is true. It's just not true. Here, just to give you a sense, I, back to history, I used to teach history, so had to teach the explorers. Let's see, all about explorers.com.org. What is this? Yeah, yeah, all about explorers, A to Z. So I'll go to this one. I just teach these guys, Columbus, Drake, to Gamma, we'll do Drake, Drake, because I was in New Jersey <laughs> just last week. Okay, Francis Drake was born around the year 1542 in Wayne, New Jersey. His love of the ocean can be traced back to the early days he spent at the Jersey Shore <laughs> in the lovely retirement town of Wildwood. Okay, so he hung out with his parents on the beach. Then here's the map. And he, all of his journeys leave from Newark. <laughs> and I can go on and on. I can show all kinds of stuff that's not true. OK, now, uh, how do we validate? Here's what we do. We go to Alta Vista, and we will do the Martin Luther King thing. Let's say link colon. I'm going to put some things together that we've already done. This will be good review for the end. First thing I want to know, who's linked to that site? And we have 95,000 web pages linked to that site. But I'm an academic. These days I teach at a university, so I want to know, post colon edu. Watch this trick. From 95,000, I cut down only to 413, but they're all universities linked to Martin Luther King. Not dot coms, not dot orgs, only edus. Do you see the grammar and the syntax? This is like teaching you how to read a book, like teaching you table of contents. That's all this is. No, no rocket science here. Just a couple of words. Gets me. And I know that Stormfront owns Martin Luther King. I did some other research. Link colon www.stormfront.org. Now, because I put in two links, one to Martin Luther King, one to Stormfront, I have seven. These seven web pages have a link to both. I'll show you. Web credibility exercise at Bakersfield State, California. That's the web address. California State University, Bakersfield. Yes. That's the link to Martin Luther King. That's the link to Stormfront. Do you understand? You cannot see these links going into those sites unless you know how to use a search engine to show you which other sites are linked in. And I can do that. And this is nice because I can cross-reference. Cross-referencing the web is step one to validating. Cross-reference. And this university is explaining that the martinlutherking.org site first appears to be historic writings in a tribute, but on closer examination is to discredit Dr. King and it's owned by a white supremacist group, Stormfront. So with a few keywords, I can get the academic community. Here, I'll give you a more serious example. A friend of mine was just diagnosed with breast cancer. And her doctor told her not to go to the web because 
she would find bogus cures and pharmaceutical companies trying to sell her their own chemo therapy. So she went to her friend who came to me. The friend is a teacher. So imagine a friend of yours comes to you and says, you have the web in your classroom. My doctor won't let me go to the web, but she's educated and she wants some control over her life. So she wants to do her own research. She doesn't want to obey her doctor, you understand. And she comes to you and she says, teach me. How do I use the web to find the latest research, the latest? Well, unfortunately, she types in breast cancer, like that, and does a search and she comes up with YouTube, which might be interesting, I don't know, and Flickr, which is personal, and AOL, and oh my gosh, the, the, the Insta blogs, all kinds of stuff. Did I mean breast cancer? Oh yeah, I did. I misspelled it? Well, Wikipedia is at the top, you see? Now you know why. It says breast cancer in the address. And the title page will be breast cancer. Okay, but that's not it. Because the sites at the top are there because they have the most links coming in. Do you remember that part? So the sites that have been up the longest have potential for the most links. Not the most recent, but how long they've been there. This is like getting the oldest books first. Unless you know a couple of tricks. And they're just trick. View, colon, timeline. This is magic. When you click search, the web changes completely into a timeline. I can go back and forth. I want to hit the 2008 bar. I click the 2008 bar. Now I have the latest research in breast cancer. View colon timeline. Yeah, wow. At some point, and I don't mean to get too down on this, but people like to have control of their life. They like to solve problems. They like information. They want to make intelligent decisions. Some people even want to know what their doctor knows. I don't know. It depends on your diagnosis and who you are. But at some point, everyone will become desperate for good quality information. Everybody. And at that point, I think you should know how the web works. So you're not manipulating. Especially in something like breast cancer. That's not a good thing. So there we are. And uh, it's amazing, the difference. By the way, view colon timeline, if I were again teaching the American Revolution, I would do that. American Revolution. View colon timeline. Click search. Now I have the American Revolution. Stuff started happening in 1750. Very different than if you only type American Revolution without view colon timeline. Okay, let me, uh, let me check my time. I have to come to some logical, ah good, I still have 13 minutes. So, so far, I want to show you one more site on global collaboration. By the way, this is my favorite site in the last month. They changed for me, but I love kiva.org because I met the young girl who started it. Oh my gosh. This is truly an amazing site. Kiva, maybe you've heard of this Nobel Prize that was based on microeconomic lending that if you only give a little bit of money to entrepreneurs in third world countries and they have to pay it back, that it's a better investment in sustainable improvement than if you give the same amount of money to the government to help the people. You help the people directly. It's well documented now. So every day, they have hundreds of stories of real people in different third world countries, including a number of the 55 who speak French. And Spanish. So if you're studying languages, you can go to Kiva, or you're studying the rainforest, you're studying calculus and rates of return, you can connect this to all kinds of curriculum. Oh no, it's in French. Is that French? I don't have a, I don't know what they're saying. Oh, now I know exactly what they're saying. <laughs> now, 
But let's just say, let's just say you are teaching French. And you find out that there's this sheep herder in Senegal. And the sheep herder, it's too late. You can't invest because they already got all the money. But you could have contributed. The minimum investment is $25. The sheep herder wants $350 to do what? To <laughs> probably raise more sheep. Uh, he lives in some district. He's devoted entirely to raising sheep, Take advantage of the winter season. He's got to strengthen his flock, and he wants a loan. Now, so let's say you give $25 to this Ibrahim Abba, or you don't. You, you don't even give $25. But what you do know is how to use RSS. You see RSS? RSS. RSS means that as soon as he, he gives a story every month. Every month from this point on, once he has the money, he's going to talk about what he did with the money in French. And you can hit subscribe. And that goes to your RSS reader, which is going to be a leap. But you have talent, by the way. I have to tell you, I'm having more fun today than I deserve, because I know how much talent is in the school to help you. And on November 4th, you're going to have a follow-up day when your colleagues are going to share what they're doing with technology with all of you, right? So you're going to do this follow-up. Now, RSS brings me to my blog lines account, and I can click subscribe now and just trust me from this point forward whenever there's a new story it comes right to me I don't have to go back to the website it comes to me so the assignment in French is to put my students on Kiva and find the people around the world who are speaking French who have a story to tell where they get these reports as a continuous stream all year. Now, if you take $25 and you invest, then you have personal interest. How many of you have used Kiva like this in your teaching? Where you're teaching children to add value to people in a faraway place? It's not a bad idea if you like responsibility and social justice and the concept that you should give to others and link it to your curriculum. Not a bad idea. Kiva.org. Okay, so that's Kiva. Okay, next job. Now I'm leaving the global scene and I'm gonna show you in Google, one more time, back to Google, in my own teaching. Uh, first I'm gonna show you someone else's teaching. I have a friend who teaches calculus and pre-calculus in uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba. By the way, out of three million, almost four million, his blog is the second one. So many people are linked to it. He doesn't have calculus in his website. He has Cal in his name, but not his web address. So he teaches uh, pre-cal and AP. So we'll click on AP. He has three blogs. Blogging's not bad either, by the way. I really like blogging. And I have to wait for some more stuff to come in. No, I don't. I'll just jump January. OK. My friend actually studies why students do not do well in math. And one of the things he's learned is that there are lots of high school students who actually do not take accurate notes. Do you believe that? They, they are writing furiously, especially in a class like calculus or pre-calculus. It literally is Greek to them. They, they don't have an intuitive sense of where these equations come from. They're just memorizing. Many students couldn't figure it out on their own. Do you understand? I hope I'm not putting it down. But it's just the reality. It's just the way it is. And so he learned by watching that What's really needed are more accurate notes. So every day, he assigns one student, it's going to be you, young lady. Today, 
you are the official scribe for calculus. You and I are going to meet sometime today. You're going to show me your notes, and I'm going to make sure they are perfect. And then they're going up on the web. And tomorrow it's you, next day it's you, and so forth. So every student becomes part of the scribe. Now, at this point, I always get a teacher asking, I'm going to play both roles, okay? I always get a teacher asking, why would the other children learn if they know they don't have to take notes? I always get that question. By the way, I'm just going to tell you, in his school, he's a troubleshooter, Canadians do things differently. They send people in to actually teach in schools that fail. They find their best teachers, then they send them in. This guy is the best. This school went from the second worst test scores in the province to the second highest neighborhood school. No charter, just neighborhood. And when you have an official scribe taking the notes, the children in class are freed up to ask questions. All of a sudden, there's more conversation because everyone is furiously taking the same notes. So the intuition that learning will go down actually is the reverse. Learning goes up, not down. Up. I want them to be independent. Yes. Yes. I want them to be independent. Have you tried it? No. You haven't tried it? Well, here, I'll show you my notes. You know what? I'll show you mine. I teach a doctoral class, not in math, in leadership and managing change, but um, let's see, Google. In Google, for those of you who don't know, there's a free word processor on the web, and it's called Google Docs. And I have a whole bunch of docs in, whoa. Uh, wrong account, hang on. Which one was this? A November. Uh, hang on for a second. Alan, November Learning. By the way, that is my ma mail if you ever want to email me. Uh, let's see. Did you ever forget your password? Is it? All right. Interview questions for Thomas Friedman. Ah, uh, session notes. Okay. Now, in my class, well, who thinks they can go home? You have great notes from today, and you can do everything I just did. Let's say this was a class. How many of you believe that you, can, you have good notes from today, and you can go home and do it? Nobody in the room. Nobody in the room? Nobody in the room. One person? Most of you, or well, you aren't taking this seriously anyway, but let's say you were my class, you still wouldn't get it. I go so fast. I know my stuff, and I go really fast. Bing, bang, jing, search engine, boom, boom, boom. You, you, you couldn't go home from this. This is, this is terrible. This wasn't learning. You're sitting here. You can't. Now, in my class, if this were really a class, I, um, at any moment, by the way, 200 people can write notes on the same word processor on the web. This word processor is on the web, not in my hard drive. You value that? You understand what I mean? Google gives you free word processor on the web. How many of you have used Google Docs? All right, you see, lots of people in the room have already experienced what I've said. Free. By the way, for teachers, it's pretty cool, because if you start using Google Docs just for yourself, all of your documents are available on any computer in the world, wherever you go. You have a computer at home, you come to school, you go to the library, you go to a friend's house, you go to mother-in-law's, wherever you go in the world, you have all your stuff. Yeah. Fine. Now, this, these are the notes from my last class. And I assigned students to be editors. And they put in links. This is better than paper, because it has links that are active. 
And my students can go home. You know what's really cool? They'll go home and they'll think about it and they'll add more. Here, I'll show you. Remember I showed you Jing? I showed you Jing. So I said, use Jing. They wrote, use Jing. But I did not know, I show you, and I squint. Those are two more free tools to do the same thing. But my grad, but students knew. So they added it in. The notes are better than what I do. They're better. If you're on the web and you're teaching children to do searching and build a search engine, those notes are growing organically all the time. Not just when you're in class. You want to teach people responsibility and discipline? Teach them to add value when they're not in class. That's discipline. Teaching them in class, that's too easy. That's not enough, in my opinion. So, then I have to, I have to admit to you what does go wrong. You always want to know well, what, what does go wrong. And I got vandalized. One of my students put in a section called Fun Stuff. And I had to take it out. It's blank now. I erased all the fun stuff. And the reason I did that is because fun stuff was my balding head lined up. They got pictures of me from all over the web, and they put me up there with captions that were not nice. In fact, the nicest one was polish my noggin. And from there, it went downhill very fast. And so I said to the class, who did that? And of course, nobody raise their hand. But I didn't teach them the trick that every teacher ought to know. When you go up to file and you want to know what really happened, you hit revision history. And the revision history gives you everybody's name and what they added and when they added it. And I'm just going to tell you, it was Michael Parent. I got it. Just like that. Now, for those of you who teach writing, English teachers, history teachers, science, middle school teachers, elbow, you teach writing. Writing has to be one of the most difficult things to teach. Time consuming, labor, oh my gosh, you can spend hours on one essay. How do you wake up in the morning? I don't know, but hard. Now, if your students wrote in Google Docs, you would see the development of every idea. For those children who are struggling, you get much more information than just a draft on a piece of paper. You see the flow of ideas. Google Docs. Further, in Google Docs, my daughter, who, she's now 20, but when she was in high school, she came home one day, and she said, Daddy, can you die of boredom? And I said, Jesse, is this about school? She said, yeah, it's about history. She loves history. And um, see, they have these tools. Presentation, that's like uh, PowerPoint. So I'm going to open up PowerPoint in Google Docs. You, you know what this does. I can make a slide, bring pictures in. So I said, what's wrong, honey? She said, well, we're doing World War II, and the teacher has decided to use technology, and every kid has to do a PowerPoint on World War II, and we're showing PowerPoint over three days. Today was the second day, and tomorrow I'm going to die. <laughs> because why would you sit through 25 kids showing PowerPoint? This is terrible. With Google Docs, all the kids in history could have designed one PowerPoint together at home, in the library, at school, 20, at any time, together, teamwork. And that they would be having it available before the exam, rather than sitting on some kid's computer. It's on the web. And my work on businesses, because I work for Apple and AT&T, I do corporate stuff too, the number one skill that businesses are looking for are people who can collaborate and work together. They can write together, they can design together, they can make airplanes together, they can research medicine together. They gotta do it together. Individual work, more and more, is no longer sufficient. So the tools of collaboration, designing a search engine together, writing together, 
producing a podcast together. Globally connected kids to camera room in French. All the connections we've been talking about are actually very highly valued skills on the corporate side. I know they're not valued in school. I understand it's individual kids doing individual homework, passing in individual papers to get an individual grade. The whole culture is set up for the individual. But that was for the Industrial Revolution. It's over. So, just to wrap up, let's see. I'm a little late. Uh, I think, one, we've underestimated what children are willing to do because we haven't asked them to make a lot of contributions to the other children. So that's one. If kids were with you, who you teach, and they were sitting next to you, I think they might have processed this with a sense of excitement. When can we do this? And for those of you who spend time in very difficult to teach situations, whatever that is, chances are your kids need more help than you can give them alone. And all these tools add up to contribution of a lot of people helping everyone. And the globally connected stuff, whether it's grandmothers in kindergarten, or teaching languages or history, is just so exciting. When the bell rings, chances are kids won't leave. So I think it's a fun time. I think it's a hugely fun time. And it's up to you to take the risk of going beyond what you've ever done before. But you have great resources in place here which makes coming to Wilmington one of the most exciting visits I will have this year. So thanks for your indulgence. I hope I didn't bore you. Thank you. Yay. suggested that you do today, like creating a search engine, or, or looking to find um, good websites for the sources for your classroom. So we want you to take what Alan got us all excited about today and be able to give you some time to try out, do some experimenting, take some risks, and then bring it back to your classroom. I hope you enjoyed the afternoon as much as I did. Alan, thank you so, so much.